Hey students, Mrs. Dukoski here for your chapter 12 Catcher in the Rye lesson. So chapter 12, Holden is still out. It's Saturday night. It's so late on Saturday. Keeping in mind this whole book so far has taken place over the course of one really long day. So all of his time at Pensy, his time on the train traveling to the city, his time in the city so far is just one really long day. So it's still Saturday, really late into the evening, probably going into, you know, Sunday early, you know, late night, early morning, and he's out. So this is Holden being rebellious. He just left the lavender room um, where he was hanging out with some girls. He started thinking about Jane Gallagher, the last chapter, we really talked about her. And now he's still out. He's like, I am rebelling. I am not here to conform. I did that at Pensy Prep and that wasn't for me and I need to experience something else. So he decides he's going to go to this um, club named Ernie's. So we're going to talk about that. This whole chapter is set at Ernie's. It's this club in Greenwich Village, which I want to talk about. It's an area in New York City. It's a neighborhood in New York City. It's really famous. Maybe you've been there. Um, but he goes to this club um, where he's going to go hear this musician named Ernie. And that's where we're going to get started. But before we start that, we're going to do our B now. So our B now, which again, a B now is just for all of us to really come together and be in the present moment and whatever is distracting us to kind of set it aside and either do some movement, do some breath work, do some meditation, something that can like focus us so that we're ready for our lesson. So with that, I have a brief little um, breathing exercise meditation for you. It's all of two minutes and I'll share it and we'll do it together. And then we'll get started with chapter 12. So. All right, so here is our meditation. And this is um, from Yoga International. They have some really awesome programs available if you're interested in exploring. So this is Yoga International Balanced Breathing Practice. So balancing your breath is so important. If you're ever feeling unsteady, um, connecting to your breath is the fastest way to feel calm and balanced. So this is just a balanced breathing practice. So find a place where you can sit comfortably. You could even lie down or stand, but it's going to ask you to be somewhere where you can comfortably sit or again, lie or stand and access your breathing. So here we go. Shifting side to side, finding balance and stability in your pelvis. Your seat should feel comfortable and even as you lengthen up through your spine and soften your shoulders. Now, allow your eyes to close or soften your gaze. Notice your breath. The sensation of the movement of the breath in your body. The tempo of the inhalation and exhalation. Notice if either the inhale or the exhale is longer than the other. And now gently begin to coax the inhale and exhale into a steady, even pattern. Counting up on the inhale, one, two, three. Counting down on the exhale, three, two, one. Inhale. One, two, three. Exhale. Three, two, one. If this count feels constricting or agitating in any way, change the duration, either shorter or longer and measure your breath in an even count that feels comfortable to you. Inhale, one, two, three. Exhale, three, 
two, one. Continue your even breathing. This type of breathing can help bring balance to both the body and the mind, allowing us the opportunity to approach each breath, each life circumstance with equanimity, harmony, and composure. The breath is even, steady, and supportive. You can continue breathing in this even count, or whenever you're ready, release the count and allow your breath to return to its natural tempo. Open your eyes and re-enter your day. I hope you're feeling balanced and calm. I love those little breathing exercises. And again, it was just a three minute be now, balanced breath to just bring you into your body and mind in a, in a way that feels like you can be present for the lesson that we're about to do. So with that, I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll offer so much more and reach out to me if you have any questions or want some more resources. I'd love to share more if you're interested. Um, but again, those are, are great ways for you to just sort of like, you know, check in with yourself and steady yourself and be available for the work that you're about to do. So now we're going to earnings. So earnings is exciting. I even dressed up for it because it is a club in Greenwich Village. So if you need to pause and go put on something dressy, because we're about to go to this club in Greenwich Village. So with that, um, I am gonna do a quick screen share. I wanna talk about that setting because it's such a dynamic setting and Holden's about to go you know, into this place in an, an area in New York City that is just really well known. So if you're not familiar with it, we're gonna talk about it quickly. If you are, that's awesome. Maybe you've even been there. But with that said, let's get into our share again. And I'm going to get into my Schoology page and find my chapter 12 lesson. It looks like this. So with that said, we've done our Git breathing together. If you need a quick chapter 11 review, it's right here for you. And then our chapter 12, we're going to focus on setting, time period, and language. So again, holding up this club called Ernie's. And he's going to have fun. He's in the cool hip village. And that is what we're going to talk about right now. So Greenwich Village, otherwise known as the village, is this epicenter of counterculture movements. And it's right in Manhattan. It's in New York City, right? Um, so of course, this is the best place, I think, one of the best places on earth for Salinger, our writer, to have Holden go to be rebellious, all right? Again, it's like this really well-known neighborhood in New York City that's like been the home of counterculture movements. And Holden is feeling like he wants to be rebellious. He wants to counter the culture that's being pushed on him. And so he's going to hang out there and rebel against this uptight conformity of the 1950s that his society's really been heavy-handed at pushing his way. So the village is hub for bars, clubs, music, art, restaurants, counterculture, diversity, nonconformists, freedom, open-minded beliefs and ideas, and this really famous um, university called NYU, right? New York University. So maybe you've heard of it. So that's in the village area of New York City. So with that, we have like a couple links here that I'm going to click on. We won't watch all of them, but if you want to, you know, take a pause and these are in the description and watch these entire videos, these are, you know, one's a quick tour of Greenwich Village. Hill with New York City. 
your cabin sat. It's a beautiful day in May. We're in Greenwich Village, home to a community that has arguably changed the world. We're going to show you around a bit. A great place to start our tour of Greenwich Village is Washington Square Park, home of the Arch. Built in the late 1800s to celebrate George Washington's presidency. The park is a meeting place for both young and old. You'll find impromptu live music, playgrounds, street performers, chess tables, and more. Surrounded by New York University housing, this area is young and alive. All right, that's a good place to stop. If you want to pause again and watch the entire tour, I highly recommend it. It's in the description and it's in your lesson notes. So this is a video tour of Greenwich Village. They started you at Washington Square Park, which is infamous with that arch, right? And then they're gonna like tour you around the rest of this cool, funky neighborhood. But this is where Holden is. This is where the club is. And so again, he's there at night. It's late on Saturday night and he's going to this jazz club. So jazz is like, again, a type of music that you should be familiar with. Um, it was really sort of like this popular, there were these popular jazz clubs that started um, springing up in the 1920s in New York City. And then they really like took over the scene. So this is gonna just get started. And again, uh, we'll watch the first minute or so. But if you want to pause this video and find the link in the description or your lesson notes and watch this entire video right now before the rest of our lesson, please do so. But it's gonna talk about the most iconic jazz clubs in New York City, because that's a really cool scene to know a little bit about too, because he's going to a club like this. split open when I heard Thelonious Monk play around midnight. I heard it in my parents' room. They were listening to it. I just happened to walk in that they were listening to it. And I heard, you know. That's some ugly shit, you know? <laughs> it is ugly. And I was like, I want to know how to do that. <laughs> Jazz is a very exuberant art form. It's one that defines an age of America. It's one that also defines the kind of restlessness the country is going through. And so therefore, it's also maybe it's the most popular style of music back then. It's the party music. It's the social music. It's the music that's also, as it starts to reach other countries across the world, starts to kind of create a frenzy. New York will never be without jazz clubs. Let me just say that. And I just hope that will last forever. <laughs> it will never be without it because this, that's, it's a music that's kind of part of this city like hip hop is. Like country music is for fucking Texas and Nashville. <laughs> it's a part of the sound of this city in a way that cannot be kind of stripped away, hopefully. All right, that's a great place to stop. Um, and he has this lovely description excuse his, you know, enthusiasm with some of his language, um, but he has this lovely description of what jazz music is, and you get to hear some jazz music in the background. So this is perfect. And these shots of New York City, this is where Holden is. He's going to this jazz club. He mentions Ernie, who is the pianist, the jazz musician that's, you know, he, he's going to go see. And, and he, he's excited about it. And then he does mention in, at the end of chapter 11, the last paragraph, he's going to Ernie's um, and he's excited about that, but he describes Ernie quickly. And I want to talk about that. So at the very end of chapter 11, and we'll just look at it quickly. Oh, I'm sorry. That is just in my way. Sorry. There we go. So at the end of chapter 11, he talks about Ernie and he calls Ernie, and I don't love his description, um, but this is how Salinger has fr phrased it. Ernie's a big, fat, colored guy that plays piano. 
so there's you know some some derogatory adjectives there um but then he said you know he gives him credit for he he says he's kind of a phony but he's a great piano player um he can really play the the piano so i want to talk about a couple words here he calls him big and fat which we know you know are just derogatory shaming descriptions that he just kind of throws out there and he also uses the word colored so i have i want to pause for a second and go back to the worksheet I have here a little bit about language and the shifting lexicon of race. So this is a really important topic to dig into. So language helps define a culture, but notice how language has shifted since Salinger wrote Catcher in 1950. Can you imagine talking like Holden, right? Something to always take notice of is the lexicon of race. Changes in the words and phrases that we use are important. They suggest progress through the ages. And as suggested in this first article, um, the NPR article, changes in the words and phrases we use to describe each other reflect whatever progress we make on the path toward a world where everyone feels respected and included. And I think that's so important. And if you get into these articles, so here's the one um, from NPR. And then there's another one up from the New York Times about just the language, where are these popping up? Just the language that we use. So I would, I would take a moment either during now to pause or, you know, after this lesson to look over these articles, because it is important for you to be aware about what language is appropriate during the time that you're living. And then also to recognize how that is maybe shifted. So when you see these other descriptions um, that you understand during the time period that those books were written, these were the phrases that were being used. So that's what these articles sort of talk about, is that language is always shifting and what might have been appropriate and the language that we see being used in books from another time period, it's, you know, change. And, and we have to respect that change because it suggests progress. So we have to be aware of those things. So it really goes into the shifting language descriptions about race. And um, particularly the use of that word colored, um, shifting from that in 1950, 50, this is, you know, mid 20th century where Salinger's writing to minorities, which was generally accepted, and to now the term that we hear, um, which is people of color. So this is important. And I think that um, it, when you have a moment, either pause this video or afterwards read through this article. And it does, it goes over the nuances of that language. And there's another article too um, that's, that's worth checking out. So that's the language that I wanted to point out. And now we're going to get into going to Ernie's. So here's Ernie, right? Holden's going to Ernie's and he's going to take a cab and he's going to go to the village and he's going to have this cool time at this very cool jazz club where Ernie's playing the piano. So we'll get started. And this is in the PDF on page 44. The cab I had was a real old one that smelled like someone just tossed his cookies in it. I always get those vomity kind of cabs if I go anywhere late at night. What made it worse, it was so quiet and lonesome out, even though it was Saturday night. I didn't see hardly anybody on the street. Now and then you just saw a man and a girl crossing a street with their arms around each other's waists and all, or a bunch of hoodlumy looking guys with their dates, all of them laughing like hyenas at something you could bet wasn't funny. New York's terrible when somebody laughs on the street very late at night. You can hear it for miles. It makes you feel so lonesome and depressed. I kept wishing I could go home and shoot the bull for a while with old Phoebe. But finally, after I was riding a while, the cab driver and I sort of struck up a conversation. His name was Horowitz. He was a much better guy than the other driver I'd had. Anyway, I thought maybe he might know about the ducks. So just a quick pause. Again, a scene with the cab driver, this is reminiscent of, you know, the, the previous chapter 
where Holden got in a cab and asked the cab driver about the ducks in Central Park. So here we come back to that and keeping in mind that the ducks are a symbol we'll talk more about, but you know, what do they symbolize? Start throwing that around if you haven't thought about it too much and know that they are a symbol in this book. So he says to the cab driver, hey Horowitz, I said, you ever passed by the lagoon in Central Park, down by Central Park South? The what? The lagoon, the little lake, like there where the ducks are, you know? Yeah, what about it? Well, you know the ducks that swim around in it in the springtime and all? Do you know what happens? Or do you happen to know where they go in the wintertime by any chance? Well, who goes? The ducks, do you know by any chance? I mean, does somebody come around in a truck or something and take them away, or do they fly away by themselves, go south or something? Old Horowitz turned all the way around and looked at me. He was a very impatient type guy. He wasn't a bad guy though. How the hell should I know? He said, how the hell should I know a stupid thing like that? Don't get so sore about it, I said. He was sore about it or something. Who's sore? Nobody's sore. I stopped having a conversation with him. If he was going to get so damn touchy about it, but he started it up again. He turned all the way around again and said, the fish don't go no place. They stay right where they are, the fish, right in the goddamn lake. The fish, that's different. The fish is different. I'm talking about the ducks, I said. What's different about it? Nothing's different about it, Horowitz said. Everything he said. He sounded sore about something. It's tougher for the fish, the winter and all, than it is for the ducks. For Christ's sakes, use your head, for Christ's sakes. I didn't say anything for about a minute. Then I said, all right, what do they do, the fish and all, when that whole little lake's a solid block of ice, people skating on it and all? Old Horowitz turned around again. What the hell you mean, what do they do, he yelled at me. They stay right where they are, for Christ's sakes. They can't just ignore the ice. They can't just ignore it. Who's ignoring it? Nobody's ignoring it, Horowitz said. He got so damn excited and all. I was afraid he was going to drive the cab right into a lamppost or something. They live right in the goddamn ice. It's their nature for Christ's sakes. They get frozen right in one position for the whole winter. Yeah? What do they eat then? I mean, if they're frozen solid, they can't swim around looking for food and all. Their bodies for Christ's sake. What's the matter with you? The bodies take in nutrition and all right through the goddamn seaweed and crap that's in the ice. They got their pores open the whole time. That's their nature for Christ's sakes. See what I mean? He turned way the hell around again to look at me. Oh, I said. I let it drop. I was afraid he was going to crack the damn taxi up or something. Besides, he was such a touchy guy. It wasn't any pleasure discussing anything with him. Would you care to stop off and have a drink with me somewhere? I said. <coughs> He didn't answer me, though. I guess I was still thinking. I asked him again, though. He was a pretty good guy. Quite amusing and all. I ain't got no time for liquor, bud, he said. How the whole hell old are you, anyways? Why ain't you home in bed? I'm not tired. When I got out in front of our Ernie's and paid the fare, old Horowitz brought up the fish again. He certainly had it on his mind. Listen, he said. You was a fish. Mother Nature take care of you, wouldn't she? Right. You don't think them fish just die when it gets to be winter, do you? No, but you're goddamn right they don't, Horowitz said and drove off like a bat out of hell. He was about the touchiest guy I ever met. Everything you said made him sore. Even though it was so late, Ernie's was jam-packed. So this is a village. This is exciting, right? This is where you're going to go and have fun. So he says, mostly with prep school jerks and college jerks. Almost every damn school in the world gets out earlier for Christmas vacation than the schools I go to. <coughs> Excuse me. You could hardly check your coat. It was so crowded. It was pretty quiet, though, because Ernie was playing the piano. It was supposed to be something holy, for God's sakes, when he sat down at the piano. Nobody that good. About three couples besides me were waiting for tables, and they were all shoving and standing on tiptoes to get a look at old Ernie while he played. He had a big damn mirror in front of the piano with this big spotlight on him so that everybody could watch his face while he played. You couldn't see his fingers while he played, just his big old face. Big deal. I'm not too sure what the name of the song was that he was playing when I came in. But whatever it was, he was really stinking it up. He was putting all these dumb show-offy ripples in the high notes and a lot of other very tricky stuff 
It gives me a pain in the ass. You should have heard the crowd, though, when he was finished. You would have puked. They went mad. They were exactly the same morons that laugh like hyenas in the movies at stuff that isn't funny. I swear to God. I were a piano player or an actor or something and all those dopes thought I was terrific. I'd hate it. I wouldn't even want them to clap for me. People always clap for the wrong things. If I were a piano player, I'd play it in the goddamn closet. Anyway, when he was finished and everybody was clapping their heads off, old Ernie turned around on a stool and gave this very phony humble bow. Like as if he was a hell of a humble guy. Besides being a terrific piano player. It was very phony. I mean, him being such a big snob and all. In a funny way, though, I felt sort of sorry for him when he was finished. I don't even think he knows anymore when he's playing right or not. It isn't his, all his fault. I partly blame all those dopes that clapped their heads off. They'd foul up anybody if you gave them a chance. Anyway, it made me feel depressed and lousy again. And, I'm damn near, and I damn near got my coat back and went back to the hotel. It was too early, and I didn't feel much like being all alone. They finally got me this stinking table, right up against a wall and behind a goddamn post, where you couldn't see anything. It was one of those tiny little tables that if you, if the people at the next table don't get up to let you by, and they never do, the bastards, you practically have to climb into your chair. I ordered a scotch and soda which is my favorite drink next to frozen daiquiris. If you were only around six years old, you could get liquor at Ernie's. The place was so dark and all, and besides, nobody cared how old you were. You could even be a dope fiend and nobody would care. I was surrounded by jerks. I'm not kidding. At this other tiny table, right to my left, practically on top of me, there was this funny looking guy and his funny looking girl. They were around my age, or maybe just a little older. It was funny. You could see they were being careful as hell not to drink up in the minimum too fast. I listened to their conversation for a while because I didn't have anything else to do. He was telling her about some pro football game he'd seen that afternoon. He gave her every single goddamn play in the whole game. I'm not kidding. He was the most boring guy I've ever listened to. And you could tell his date wasn't even interested in the goddamn game. She was even funnier looking than he was, so I guess she had to listen. Real ugly girls have it tough. I feel so sorry for them sometimes. Sometimes I can't even look at them, especially if they're with some dopey guy that's telling them all about a football game. On my right, the conversation was even worse though. On my right, there was this very Joe Yale looking guy in a gray flannel suit and one of those flitty looking tattersall vests. All those Ivy League bastards look alike. My father wants me to go to Yale or maybe Princeton, but I swear I wouldn't go to one of those Ivy League colleges if I was dying for God's sakes. Anyway, this Joe Yale looking guy had a terrific looking girl with him. Boy, she was good looking. But you should have heard the conversation they were having. In the first place, they were both slightly crooked. He, what he was doing, he was giving her a peel under the table <laughs> and at the same time telling her, all about some guy in his dorm that had eaten a whole bottle of aspirin and nearly committed suicide. His date kept saying to him, how horrible. Don't, darling, please don't, not here. Imagine giving somebody a feel and telling them about a guy committing suicide at the same time. They killed me. I certainly began to feel like a prize horse's ass though, sitting there all by myself. There wasn't anything to do except smoke and drink. What I did do, though, I told the waiter to ask old Ernie if he'd care to join me for a drink. I told him to tell him I was DB's brother. I don't think he ever even gave him my message, though. Those bastards never give your message to anybody. All of a sudden, this girl came up to me and said, Holden Caulfield. Her name was Lillian Simmons. My brother DB used to go around with her for a while. She had very big knockers. Hi, I said. I tried to get up, naturally, but it was some job getting up in a place like that. He, she had some Navy officer with her that looked like he had a poker up his ass. How marvelous to see you, old Lillian Simmons said, strictly a phony. <coughs> Excuse me. How's your big brother? That's all she really wanted to know. He's fine. He's in Hollywood. Hollywood? How marvelous. What's he doing? I don't know. Writing, I said. I didn't feel like discussing it. You could tell she thought it was a big deal. He being in Hollywood, almost everybody does. Mostly people who've never read any of his stories. It drives me crazy though. 
How exciting old Lillian said. She, then she introduced me to the Navy guy. His name was Commander Blop or something. He's one of those guys that think they're being a pansy if they don't break around 40 of your fingers when they shake hands with you. God, I hate that stuff. Are you all alone, baby? Old Lillian asked. She was blocking up the whole goddamn traffic in the aisle. You could tell she liked to block up a lot of traffic. This waiter was waiting for her to move out of the way, but she didn't even notice him. It was funny. You could tell the waiter didn't like her much. You could tell even the Navy guy didn't like her that much, even though he was dating her. And I didn't like her very much. Nobody did. You had to feel sort of sorry for her in a way. Don't you have a date, baby? She asked me. I was standing up now, and she didn't even tell me to sit down. She was the type that keeps you standing up for hours. Isn't he handsome? She said to the Navy guy. Hold in. You're getting handsomer by the minute. The Navy guy told her to come on. He told her they were blocking up the whole aisle. Hold in. Come join us, old Lillian said. Bring your drink. I was just leaving, I told her. I have to meet somebody. You could tell she was just trying to get in good with me so that I could tell old DB about it. Well, you so, you little so-and-so, all right for you. Tell your big brother I hate him when you see him. Then she left. The Navy guy and I told each other we were glad to meet each other, which always kills me. I'm always saying glad to have met you to somebody I'm not at all glad I met. If you want to stay alive, you have to stay, say stuff like that. After I told her I had to meet somebody, I didn't have any goddamn choice except to leave. I couldn't even stick around here old Ernie play something halfway decent. But I certainly wasn't going to sit down at a table with old Lillian Simmons and the Navy guy be bored to death. So I left. Made me mad, though, when I was getting my coat. People are always ruining things. All right, that's the end of chapter 12. I want to talk about Holden's tone. So tone is attitude, and let's, you know, maybe come up with some words that would describe Holden's attitude in this chapter, and we can trace it all the way back to some things that he said in the beginning. So Holden shows up here. He has that conversation with the cab driver about the ducks, which is bizarre, and then they start talking about the fish, and they probably should check their science facts. We'll get more into the ducks. Maybe we'll start the next chapter that way. Um, but this is symbolic. So we'll talk about that, I promise. I want to move forward, though, and get to Ernie's. So we get to Ernie's after this awkward conversation with the cab driver. Again, another awkward conversation with the cab driver. But notice how um, he talks. He invites the cab driver to the bar. So again, he asks a stranger to come have a drink with him. So we have to say to ourselves, um, why is Holden asking these strangers, like cab drivers, to come have a drink with him? What might that mean? What might that suggest? And then the cab driver says no and drops him off, right? Then he gets to Ernie's and he sort of like describes the scene and it's jam-packed with jerks. So this is where we're gonna talk tone and attitude. So he says it's jam-packed with jerks and you know he's kind of like giving Ernie like a backward com or backhanded compliments and then also just calling him a phony at the same time. And then, like, just looking around the room with a, with a bad attitude, right? He looks around the room and sizes up all these strangers, doesn't know any of them, just judging them. And these, these couples that are on dates, you know, insulting, in his, in his mind, this is all stream of consciousness, insulting and just being a jerk, really, for no reason. So this is all this negative bias, right? So he's like in this really like negative mindset and it comes up and he says things that, you know, are really horrible about people that he doesn't even know. <clears throat> and then we find out a little bit too that, you know, maybe what's triggering this? What's triggering Holden to have such a lousy attitude and to, you know, target people that he doesn't even know with all this judgment and, and just condescending like insults. And he, he does tell us 
that he is alone, right? And he doesn't feel like being alone. And then he kind of even gets into how he's feeling a little bit depressed, right? He orders a drink by himself and he says he can get served. Um, and then he just kind of looks around and, and says nasty things about everybody that he sees, all of these strangers who he doesn't know. And then <laughs> how he himself is alone. And he sees a girl that his brother knew and he's even in his head, she's being friendly to him and he's in his head just, you know, condescending and nasty and mean. And then he tells her that he's going to leave, so he has to leave. And then he, he leaves the Ernie's Club after this conversation with Lillian Simmons. So I'm going to stop the share for a minute. And I just want you to think. <clears throat> so here's Holden by himself. And we know that he's alone and he's been trying so hard to connect with somebody, even strangers, and he's not having much luck. And we have to say to ourselves, why is Holden having such a hard time connecting with anyone, even people that try to be friendly to him, like this Lillian Simmons. She's being friendly to him, she invites him to sit down, and he's still um, disinterested and in his head, in his stream of consciousness, he's thinking really negative things and judgments about her and everybody in Ernie's, including Ernie. And, you know, it just makes me think, like, what could Holden do a little bit differently to help himself out? How could he maybe behave a little bit differently? Or what might he need to consider so that he can shift out of this negative mindset? Because he's really having just a total negative mindset in this chapter. And it could potentially be this great club scene where he's going and people appear to be having fun and there's great music and he's in Greenwich Village and even though he's in this like hub for entertainment and excitement and culture, Holden can't have fun. <clears throat> so I'm going to leave you with that thought right now. Why can't Holden have fun even though he's brought himself to a place that seems like it has a lot of potential to be fun, what's going on with Holden? So with that, we'll start chapter 12, um, or sorry, we'll start chapter 13 in the next lesson, and we'll pick up with <clears throat> what's happening in Holden's life that might be triggering him to have all of these like negative attitudes, because that's something that we do need to examine. As much as I love Holden, and I do it, think he has many redeeming qualities, um, I do there's just some things that he needs to work on. He definitely is not being the best version of himself in this chapter. So with that, think about why is that? Why is Holden unable to really be happy? Why can't he be happy? Why can't he shake himself of this negative mindset? And maybe what can he do to be proactive to get himself out of like, I'll call it a funk for right now. All right, so with that, be well and um you know just keep your eyes on schoology for assignments and i'll see you next time for chapter 13. all right bye